this is the first time I've ever skipped sex scenes as soon as they come on. Like, I've never been bored with sex scenes until this movie. There's nothing to make them interesting as sex scenes. It's awful. But, um, okay, so my name is George, and with me is Chris, and today we are talking about, uh, well, technically we're talking about two movies, um, 365 Days, and its sequel, 365 Days, This Day. Which day is this day? I I don't know. I couldn't... (laughs) Maybe maybe it means something different in Polish. They get married. Is it that day? The movie. Or a is bunch it the day days. that she gets shot? Let's hope it's the day she gets shot. We're gonna focus talking about the second movie more, I think, because that's the one with more things to tear into. Like the the biggest problem I had with the first movie is in the plot. Yes. It's it's kind of um no it's not kind of it's very problematic and it's very gross. Yeah. In what the act, what the plot is actually about, which is kidnapping and a word that I can't say on YouTube, yes. so I'm just gonna say it, it starts with S for the first word and it starts with A for the second word. Gotcha. But that's just the story. The film itself is at least somewhat competently crafted. Mm-hmm. There's plot progression, there's character development, however minute it is. With the second movie, nothing happens. No, nothing happens. Yeah, it's just a bad movie. You're waiting for the plot to start, and the plot doesn't start. Yeah, literally the first 26 minutes of the movie is just back-to-back, slow-mo, boring <laughs> sex scenes with terrible music and no plot progression at all. It's the sex that's up front here, so let's just let's just get yeah, let's right just, into it. Why why are the what's what's wrong with the sex scenes? I'm gonna use what is supposed to be like a um, a powerful scene. Mm -hmm. Um, as an example of what I think is wrong with the sex scenes, okay? This is the best sex scene of the movie, too, as far as I'm concerned. Laura, our our main uh, character, says it's difficult to give a gift to a man who already has everything. So she gives him everything he wants to do to her, he can do. That's basically the gift, right? right? The male lead is kind of built around, you know, the basically the idea of I have unique tastes kind of guy, right? Like the dangerous lover and conventional sexual needs, blah, 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 that only she can handle. With this scene where the gift is you can do anything you want, if you really look at the tray of toys, it's just like generic vibrators and stuff, right? Yeah. Which tells me the writer, the filmmaker, that they have the sexual experimentation of a bored, very conservative middle age housewife mm-hmm. who thinks ground pepper is too spicy. It's the same. It's the exact same th- reaction I had to Fifty Shades. You keep like yeah. it's like getting darker and deeper, and you're gonna find out where things go next, and then yeah. you're like, oh, <laughs> it's it's just some more missionary. Eh? And you're so right to go to this scene first because I had the exact same reaction. I was like, oh, is something gonna happen here? And then it turns out it's yeah. light butt stuff. I think your average moviegoer have dirtier thoughts, way dirtier thoughts than this. Have fantasies that are way more extreme than this. This isn't this isn't somebody's fantasy. This feels to me just like the the, the sex you have with a partner that you've been with for a while. Yeah, it's yeah, it's basically just what you do when you have a bit more energy that day. <laughs> right. There are some styles of sex, I guess, that that feel slightly more porny than than Fifty Shades does, than the after movies do, than whatever, I don't know, I one of the other sexy thing, mm-hmm. sexy trilogies of our time. Um, anyway, like, yeah, I feel like the, really the thing that this one had to offer is that the sex is a little bit more like mainstream porn. Unfortunately for the movies, all that leads me to think is, like, wh- who would that be for? And I think another thing, really significant thing that's going on here, and the reason that I said this is at least one of the best sex scenes, is that most of the sex scenes are really, really utterly pointless, even by the standards of this. There are a few at the start where there's actually like a lot of character stuff going on in the sex scenes because in those early stages of their relationship, they're still like negotiating power and learning more about each other and like doing all mm-hmm. the things that happen in a sexual relationship. By the by the middle of the first movie, once they're having sex on a yacht for like 20 minutes in a montage mm-hmm. for some reason, um, <laughs> I was tired of watching them have sex and they have yet to add anything story-wise, character-wise, that means that sex means anything else or more to these characters. I think in the first movie, when they're when they're having their sexing on that yacht, at the very least, it's earned to a certain point. Mm-hmm. Because that happened because Laura, our main character, said so and has finally agreed to do it. Yeah. Throughout the entire first half of the movie, for like an hour, she's been fighting this whole dynamic, <laughs> or, and now she... Or li- lightly pouting, as the case may be. Light- but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to fuck me the way I like. <laughs> And the, the last part is anytime they do anything sexy with each other, like the scene on the golf course right now, mm-hmm. it just it looks so ridiculous. 
It does. I was initially excited for this movie because of this golf scene and the ridiculous thing with the whipped cream with the other couple and stuff. I had written mm -hmm. down a note early on where I was like, oh, they're going to actually like try to do some some interesting visuals and they're going to try to like switch things up a little bit and then yeah. you know, by, by 20 minutes in and, and they've exhausted their <laughs> visual imaginations. In a still frame, I can see this imagery on a, on a Playboy or a Hustler. Yes. However, once you add motion to it, it becomes ridiculous. It becomes funny. <laughs> like, yeah, it's funny well, right now. <laughs> why is she reacting that way? Nothing, ha like, nothing touched you. <laughs> it's not my kind of deal, the first movie, and it's not the kind of thing that I found sexy, but I felt that this one betrayed that sexiness a little bit, too. Because in the first mm -hmm. one, the whole idea is that uh, Don Massimo <laughs> It's like this, uh, this you know, primal, beastly alpha mm -hmm. male. She has this ludicrous monologue about him being an alpha male. And so he is very, like, sexually aggressive, and it, and it played with that very sort of dominant role for him. And in this one, they didn't do very much of that. As you've, as you've indicated, there are some scenes where they kind of pay lip service to that idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I, f I found Massimo to be quite um, surprisingly soft in this movie. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and not his... Um, First word S, second word A, self yeah. anymore. I think because the first movie got a lot of that as, uh, accusation for doing SA, mm -hmm. I think Netflix, as it usually does, flinched. I agree. So what they yeah. did is they went, okay, well, let's tone him way down, which then is a bad thing to do. Because if you're going to do a movie about a domination and submissive dynamic, you can't make the dominant person kind of limp-wristed. And this was actually my reaction to the entire movie was, um, where did Massimo go? He, he seems yeah. to have very little manly vigor. <laughs> yes. I, I'm making fun of these terms, but I don't know what else to, um, yeah, he's, well, he that's what they established. Exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's, uh, he's the, the mafia guy, mob boss. We learn that he's like aggressively expanding his organization and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the only way that actually plays in the movie is that he's like, we have to do some work in the other room. And then he yeah. <laughs> looks to be sitting alone drinking whiskey in another room. It, it, he doesn't really act in the plot very much. Where in the first one, say what you will about the guy, he uh, he acted on his hopes and dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with uh, kidnapping, murder, and S.A. Well, so we've been talking a little bit already. Let's just talk out the plot very quickly. Massimo and... Laura have been married. She uh, has, unbeknownst to Massimo, uh, lost a child due to the assassination attempt of uh, an opposing crime family. She meets Massimo's gardener, Nacho. <laughs> Essentially is indistinguishable from Massimo, but is supposed to be um, like a, a freewheeling, like hippie surfer type dude who lives in his van down by the river, actually lives at his dad's house down by the river. She decides to run away after seeing what she thinks is Massimo having sex with Anna from the first movie. Mm -hmm. We suspect that it was not Massimo or that she's been set up somehow and we're soon proved right. Uh, but anyway, she runs away with Nacho for very yeah. unclear reasons. I'm not sure why Nacho wants to be with her or why she wants to be with Nacho. Because <laughs> prior to that, their only encounter is on this, this patio just for talk. like... And then he Five goes, minutes. goes to work on the garden with, with by the way, uh, a bunch of gardening gear that clearly has never been used. So then they hang out at his beach house for like the rest of the movie. And she's, she's kind of like faced with temptation by another man thinking that her, that Massimo has cheated on her. And then at the end, there's a big John Woo shootout in a abandoned yeah. building. So the reason I just wanted to recap the plot at this point is because I wanted to pitch to you what I think the concept is, because it relates to what you were just saying earlier. I Go think on. the concept of this movie is, in the first movie, it's a battle of wills. She's supposed to teach him how to be gentle. She does, I guess. I don't know what, what that was supposed to mean in the first place. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the whole idea is based around, in these 365 days, you're going to eventually stop saying no and start saying yes. And that's what happens. She says yes to him. 
Uh, yeah. And as you noted, that's like the big change of the movie. So this second movie, I believe the concept that we're going for is now that they're married, now that Massimo has has um, set down this rule that he will respect her wishes in the end, now they both have to deal with that freedom that she has in the relationship. So they both have to... Um, so through this scenario where she's tempted by another man, they both have to deal with the question of what if she says yes to someone else. Yeah. And I think that would be the pitch for the movie. She's fighting to be free the first movie and to freely say yes. And then in the second movie, the consequences come. What if she wants to say yes to someone else? Is that interesting? No. Is it, does it play out in the movie? No. <laughs> but I I just had a feeling near the end anyway that that was like yeah. what the concept was. There's also this really frustrating dynamic, which comes from both movies, um, where she's regularly uh, placated, bought off by by shopping montages, both yeah. in, in the first movie and the second movie. Basically, she gets bored, she picks a fight with Massimo, and then and then it cuts to her like dress shopping or or driving around in the mountains in a fancy car, and then she and like they're they're bought basically, and this happens to I her think... friend in the second one too. I think this is this is really telling of the author. I think I'm just gonna say it. I think the author is an incredibly shallow person, and that might be why. Because I think from the author's point of view, her being able to go on a shopping spree is a victory, regardless of what the problem of the relationship is. I agree with you. I so I I put this to Caroline too because the the big dynamic in the first movie is she has this boyfriend at the start that she's unhappy with her complaint is that he only cares about himself and mm -hmm. i was like this is very confusing for me because the guy you get involved with massimo the entire concept <laughs> of his character is that he's like the the most aggressive alpha male like Narcissist. like selfish narcissistic guy imaginable so what's the deal and what caroline said to me was um in her view of like of uh, sort of Eastern European perceptions of gender roles. The fact that Massimo has the the money, the henchmen and everything, the means to provide this lifestyle for her um, mm -hmm. would be seen as like caring about her S or could be seen, not necessarily, not going to paint all of Eastern Europe with a broad brush here. Um, but, but that made sense to Caroline um, like from that cultural perspective. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, see that I can understand because it's a cultural thing. Which reminds me, if you're interested in listening to the full-length discussion of this episode, you can find it on our Patreon. The link is on screen and in the description down below. Uh, if you go over there, you will get the entire recording in an audio format like a podcast. Check it out. Support us. Help us keep doing this. We really appreciate it. Anyways. Another really irritating aspect of the all of these sequences where she is um, annoyed, bored, whatever it may be. Um, it's all... It, we're often sold that, like, on the other hand, she gets to rip around in these sports cars, she gets to do all this shopping, she gets to uh, be in these amazing locations, whatever. Um, but she doesn't ever look like she's having any fun. You know, I mean, I, I could give or take the gratuitous sex with Massimo, but if I was, if I got the rest of her life, I'd be pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> she's got a pretty good deal here. And all you have to do is aggressively blow Massimo. Yeah, Chris. aggressively. I don't, yeah, I would need some practice. Yeah, I, I just like, uh, just fucking enjoy Mallorca at least. It's, it's yeah. so friggin' gorgeous. Why are you not just like... Or run the business that Massimo gives her at the at the start of the second movie. Right. Nothing happened with that. Which never comes up again. <laughs> yeah. She's mad about having nothing to do. He buys her a business, which, uh, to be fair, is a ridiculous... It's a classic Massimo move where she's like... I want to do things, and he's like, okay, you'll do this thing. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, apparently she liked it, so that could be another thing you could do. How are you lost with the girl? <laughs> the baby girl, man. It, like, it, It's never used at the right spot of a sentence. It's never used in the right scenario. <laughs> and it's never delivered correctly. Like, yeah. he stresses the wrong syllable or the the wrong intonation it's just two words why is this so awful yeah and uh yeah again totally on the same page as you like i i'm i'm not here to to make fun of of people who can speak way more languages than i do 
Yeah. And uh, and and some mistranslations and stuff. I, w I do want to say I was surprised for this being like, I'm assuming a fully Netflix shepherded release. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that um, they didn't have someone just clean up the English. I'm comparing a very talented actor to this, you know, drab, but like Jackie Chan did a whole movie where he had no idea what he was saying. He <laughs> yeah. was literally just, just doing phonetic doing copying. Yeah. And he sounded so natural in that movie. It's I mean, true. he had an accent, but yeah, he was just phonetically copying someone. He has no idea what the words were. And it sounded more natural and better than this movie. I think she at least has not been in many other movies, but I would be interested to see them in a in a less dreadful movie. Because, you know, everyone hated, everyone thought Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson were the worst actors ever, and, and look at them now, so. That's true, Who that's knows? true. Maybe, yeah, it's the director probably and the material. There's a, there's a chance. A friend of mine, she really loves the first movie. She oh, loves it okay. because it's just a steamy, you know, eye candy. Yeah. Not for a plot or whatever. She just, you know, there's yeah. just a, a lot of hot guy butts, right? Yeah, he's muscly. She's a fan of it. And she's like, I follow the actor that plays Massimo on Instagram. And I quote, she says, he's so dumb in real life. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing news. Just hold my hand. Just let it go. We're about, what, an hour 30? No, an hour 40 minutes into the movie. And we are revealed a plot twist that is basically like on the level of, I don't know, Telemundo dramas. Exactly right. right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a twist that I think I can see Calculon on Futurama <laughs> yeah. playing out because it is really like right up there or right down there with I Have Amnesia. Yeah. It turns out there's a twin and Laura has been wrongly accusing... Uh, the twin of Massimo, which is who she saw at the party. And he is, it's like, it's straight up evil Massimo. Yeah. It's like, it's, just... it's the same dude, except he's kind of like, he's kind of like creepy and slumpy. And he he's like sniffing because he clearly has been doing coke all the time. And he's yeah. got like kind of darker <laughs> eyes and sunken, sunken features and stuff. It's just like yep. straight up, like, it, it's an evil twin, like the most classic evil twin twist. Yeah. And so I just got to bear my soul here. I, I fucking loved the evil twin <laughs> twist. I wanted way more evil Massimo. And I, I just, that to me, that's how these movies should be working. Because my big complaint with this movie, near the end, you know, we learn he's been expanding aggressively and now the other Dons have problems and there's going to be all this mafia stuff going on. And mm -hmm. as I said, it even leads up to like, like slow motion hero walk. To the mm -hmm, final confrontation mm -hmm. and then like gun standoff in a in a in a face-off style. And I would have loved way more of that. And I was much more entertained once things were that stupid. Up until that time, it was just her pouting and hanging out at the beach house and yeah. dreaming about yeah. having that like, what's his fuck go down on her. But yeah. all of a sudden, at the end, crammed in is all this absolutely absurd. I'm ready for a whole movie of evil evil Massimo. Yeah. If, if they yeah, if they went ahead and just did the whole film with like this level of um soap opera drama then it would have been fine as long as they stuck with it because then it will what it would become is i think it would become a sort of erotic thriller version of like commando yeah where it's like it knows it's over the top it knows the twist and plot lines are are kind of cliche but it's like it's going for it like i could have genuinely liked that potentially yeah. if it was just sillier because it yeah. is silly. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's go on to our our new segment. Um, what we can do to, uh, for this movie with Netflix uh, money, if it were us. Oh yeah, <laughs> send us money, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let us make uh, three hundred and sixty-five days four. Yeah. Thunderdome or whatever. Th yeah. <laughs> Massimo versus Massimo. My pitch for this movie is like, make it Massimo versus Massimo. I don't care about Nacho. I want Massimo <laughs> and evil Massimo. It's already set up that there's conflict between them. So I think the entire movie should have been that evil Massimo kidnaps Laura. And now Massimo is forced not only to fight evil Massimo to get Laura back, but also is is faced with the exact situation that he previously mm -hmm. put Laura in. And it all culminates with, uh, obviously, a shirtless 
uh, jujitsu fight between Massimo <laughs> and Evil Massimo, um, preferably on top of a train. Okay, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. My pitch, what I would do differently for this movie is this. I would take the transgressive sex and the power dynamic between the, the dominant one and the submissive one to, like, an extreme and just let somebody like Lars von Trier direct this. <laughs> And just go for it, you know? I mean, like, look at Nymphomaniac. It's true, yeah. Like, just do this whole movie with unsimulated sex scenes. Right. Either get Lars von Trier so it's much darker and plays to the power dynamic more, or get somebody like John Cameron Mitchell, <laughs> the oh, director yeah. of Short Bus, yeah. and, and play on the sexual dynamic, but in a fun way. Yeah, sing the Polish national anthem into Massimo's butthole. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, I genuinely love the movie Short Bus. And oh, it's such a great movie. Can you imagine that tone and that those character dynamics in this setup? Yeah, a movie, and then it would make you feel good. Yeah, Short Bus with Mafia Dons. Oh, yeah, okay, that's the pitch. We're going with that one for sure. <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> sneak the train fight in in the middle, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps it up for 730 days. <laughs> What are we doing next week? Next week, we are changing in completely different directions. We're going to go back to 2001, and we are going to watch Fast and the Furious, the first yes. one. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm genuinely very excited for this one. Yeah. We're going to go yeah. from uh, uh, middle-aged housewife fantasy to teenage boys fantasy. Yeah. I'm going to have to investigate this, this dude's Instagram that you're talking about. I wonder if he's ever <laughs> commented on Fast and the Furious. I feel like it'd be right up his alley. Oh, probably, probably. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, don't watch this movie. Yeah, don't. <laughs> Just watch porn instead. Yeah, why not? Yeah.